Samer Khatib has worked in the oil and gas industry in seven different countries over the past 15 years. After gaining extensive experience abroad, he realized he needed to have a transition and repatriation plan so that he could return to Florida and spend more time with his family. Last year, he closed on his first multifamily property and has already supplemented his entire income on his first deal. In this episode, Samer walks us through his first deal and gives us some insight into how he is managing his property while living over 7,000 miles away. So welcome back to another episode. Today we have Samer. He is joining us from Qatar. Samer, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dion. How are you? Thank you for having me. I am doing great and I'm very excited to uh, have this conversation with you. So, Samer, why don't you just go ahead and tell our listeners about uh, your background? Okay. Uh, so, I'm Syrian American. I was born in uh, Aleppo, Syria. We immigrated to the U.S. when I was six. Uh, raised in New York, New Jersey. Uh, I started working in investment banking. Uh, I was working in New York uh, as a human resource professional. About five years in, I got headhunted. For an opportunity abroad, and that's why I ended up traveling the other side of the planet, working in Doha, in, uh, in Qatar. Uh, it's been about five years there, heading up in the human resource department for a billionaire shake. Uh, lots of fun. Really enjoyed it. Really passionate about that role. Initially, when I came out, I thought two, three years uh, I would work here, and then eventually come back to the U.S. Uh, with some international experience under my belt. Uh, but that two, three years turned into like 15 years. <laughs> so I've been out here ever since. Uh, seven countries now over the course of the 15 years that I've worked in across a number of continents, uh, Netherlands, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, UAE, uh, Oman. You know, it was quite extensive. Uh, I worked in oil and gas. So I was working with Royal Dutch Shell. And... You know, every few years, you basically get up and relocate to another place and meet new and interesting people. And, you know, the experience that you build up is just phenomenal. But I know it's not sustainable and I know it's not long term. And that's really what transitioned me into real estate. So I, I was really looking at how do I eventually repatriate home? Uh, home now for me is, is Florida. I am basically south, uh, southeast Florida. And... I know that going back there after 15 years is going to be difficult to transition back into a corporate role. So I'm looking at real estate or, or my own business. I read a ton of books over the course of the last few years, and then uh, I attended a, uh, a boot camp with uh, Rod Khalif in, uh, in Denver in May of last year. And then in June, I closed on my first property. Um, and now I've been managing it, as you said, from a distance, uh, much like yourself. So can you tell us and, and walk us through that first deal? So how'd you find it? And, you know, how'd you go about the analysis and et cetera? Yeah, believe it or not, I found it on LoopNet. Uh, and I know a lot of people uh, say that's where, where you go, where deals die. But I actually, I, I, I saw this, this property, uh, tremendous curb appeal. And that's really, I think, what initially hooks you. And um, it met the criteria, the underlying criteria that I had set for myself. So I was really looking for three to five million that in terms of, uh, that was sort of my price point. I was looking for a larger deal than most, right? I was looking to target about 20 units. And so this gave me that. Uh, cap rate made sense because I was looking for anything over 6%. I was looking for cash on cash over 10%. You know, things I look for typically is um, a corner lot, uh, something that has a pitched roof, something 1980s or, or, or better. Um, you know, making sure we avoid anything that, uh, like older plumbing. You know, I, I didn't want to go into anything that, that would require a tremendous amount of work to get it up to up to date. Um, and so it ticked all those boxes. It was on the market for less than a month when I had seen it, and I moved very quickly. So I. Uh, basically made an offer. Uh, they were asking 4.2 at the time. 
Um, and I, I, brought, I tried to close them at 3.8, and eventually we got to that 3.975. So we closed on, on that uh, fairly quickly. I think I did it within 45 days. So that was a due diligence period. The inspection came out well. I was in the U.S. at the time for that, so I made it a point to fly out there. Obviously, with that kind of investment, I wanted to make it a point to be part of that due diligence process. Um, and yeah, I had, a, I had a fantastic broker that I'd met uh, that, was, that was basically hand-holding me throughout that process because it was obviously all very new to me. Um, I had a good team around me. I had a good lawyer, uh, inspection person that, I, that, that helped me with a previous transaction, which was my personal residence. And, uh, and, and the process was relatively smooth. So, so as far as uh, the analysis can, is concerned, or the initial underwriting, did you partner up with anybody to, to do that, or you did all that yourself? Yeah, no, I did it all myself. Um, I didn't have much of a network, as you can imagine, being, being abroad. So I didn't know anyone really, but I had read enough. Uh, I had read, for example, uh, Radcliffe's book on uh, you know, cash flow. I had read a ton of Robert Kiyosaki books uh, and uh, some ABCs of investing, uh, Kim McElroy. There were a few books that I had read. And so I knew how to analyze the numbers. I'm quite comfortable with numbers. So I, I was able to kind of pull together a spreadsheet and once you start getting your hands on you know t12 and the op and the uh, print rules and you start asking the right questions and you really find out what the picture looks like and then you can make the call so no that that bit wasn't wasn't difficult or, or daunting for me mm-hmm. and the real estate broker that i was working with uh, was also quite helpful in that respect because I had been looking for some time, so I was, so, I mean, at least a year, year and a half that I was looking at different deals and, you know, it was more of a, I would say, a seller's market at that point when I was coming in, so it was difficult to find deals and there were, there were a couple that I had made offers on and I was just outbid and I, I stayed disciplined around the numbers because I didn't want to put myself in a situation where I'd buy something doesn't cash flow. For me, cash flow was, was huge because that was my primary objective, right? So I wanted to get something that would cash flow to allow me to walk away from the corporate world. So, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about the actual funding aspect of the deal? Because I think a lot of people, and we mentioned this, and you actually mentioned this before we got on the call, you said that a lot of people probably wouldn't go after a 20 unit deal for you know their very first deal, right? I mean, and let alone, you know, about almost $4 million, basically. Um, so what was the funding, like the entire funding experience like? And um, did you work with lenders or, or how did you work that out? Yeah, I reached out to a few lenders and I was, you know, shopping around for rates and, and, and see what kind of terms I would get. Uh, ideally wanted something with non-recourse and something that, was interest only, and there was one one uh, particular lender that was able to provide that. Uh, I ultimately didn't go with them. I ended up going with a community bank, uh, a credit union, and I, I quite liked the relationship aspect with with that particular credit union. And for me, it was really a long term game. So this is not a, a short window. You know, I don't really have an exit strategy. I, I want to retain this property as long as I can. Ultimately pass it on to my kids. So getting a small local credit union uh, which have favorable terms, for example, if you decide to pay it down early, you know, there's no there's no late, there's no penalty around that. And there's also uh, the closing costs were quite reasonable in comparison to some of the others. So um, yeah, so I went with the 25% was uh, my initial down payment. So the loan to value was seventy. It was, uh, was, was was quite manageable. I think commercially you need to do something like that anyway. I think they were mandating that. Initially, I was reading a lot about how people were buying things with zero down, and, but I just didn't see how that that made any sense uh, if I wanted to cash flow. So twenty five percent down, and then I borrowed the rest. 
six months into the deal, I made a decision at the end of last year that I, that I, I needed more cash flow. To do that, I needed to pay more than the debt. So I ended up selling some stock and uh, the timing was actually pretty good if you, if you look at it now. So, <laughs> but I sold some stock and I now my loan to value is, is uh, you know, to a point now where I've paid off half of that, the mortgage that I took out. So I, bought, I borrowed just under three million, one and a half. Mm-hmm. And so now the cash flow is great. Now, now, now it's allowed me to achieve the, uh, the objective that I had initially set out for, which was to replace the income, which was my target was 250. To get the 250 cash flow, and the NOI at three three hundred, mm-hmm. which we're not doing. So, uh, so let me ask you this: uh, as far as because it was your first deal of this size, I mean, lenders typically may have certain experience requirements and et cetera. You know, how did you work around that, or was that even an issue for you? It it wasn't an issue. It didn't come up. I think. Uh, in terms of my net worth, I think the lenders were asking about that. So the net worth was fine. I, took, I mean, I could pay for the property in cash if I wanted to. So net worth for me was over six million at that stage. Um, so from a from a lender perspective, because it's recourse, they they don't really have any risk. So there weren't any issues securing uh, the line of credit. But I could see where. I think if it was a business, it would probably have been different. You know, if they were invest- but they look at this, they're not necessarily assessing me as an individual. I think they're really more assessing the property, the asset. And the asset itself, good location, um, really solid uh, fundamentals in terms of the, the neighborhood. I think most of the median income in that area is over 50000 um, So there's a wait list, for example, now. I mean, I have no issues renting these properties out. Um, and I think that's what they look at as opposed to me as an individual with my experience. I haven't really done any any real estate investing prior to that. It was just you'd buy a, a property, live in it, you'd sell it. And that was basically, I've done that a few times, but it was nothing multifamily at that stage. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that you said as well before we, we started recording that you've begun, or last year you started the um, value add uh, aspect of it and you've been renovating some of the units so can you tell us a little bit about that and how that's progressing yeah sure um, so I, I, I hired an interior designer and we developed a, a master plan for the community um, wanted to modernize the place I have a number of core values that I'm looking really to introduce and, and build my brand and that's really around integrity. I want to be viewed as an owner who is committed, responsive. Um, you know, for me, that that's first and foremost. The other piece is around security. Like, I want to make sure my properties are gated. Uh, I want to have you know, security cameras, ring systems uh, at all the doors. Uh, I want to. So that's two. The other one is around modern. And the fourth is around quality. So for me, the quality piece is important. That's where the value add comes in. So I'm renovating all these units. We're about 50% of the way through in terms of the renovation. I'm on now my third general contractor. So first one, of course, was the designer who acted as the contractor. Um, I spent a lot of money with her initially. Um, And that was partly by design, right? So I wanted to upgrade the first few units because they would serve as the model units and they would allow me to establish the market range that I was targeting for the area, which uh, people thought at the time I was crazy. A number of the tenants, you know, they were like, you're asking for how much, you know, and, and how on earth are you going to get that, you know, in this area? And I said, well, no, I'm looking to really introduce a product that isn't really necessarily here and, and product will speak for itself. And, uh, and, and truth be told, this actually, this tenant actually recently approached me and asked to, to be considered for, for one of the newer units, which uh, at the time he was laughing. And, 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 and so now he's, he's completely on board with that vision. So the vision now is really starting to come to fruition. So the first few units, the 
investment I made was more than I would have liked, but I felt it was necessary to, again, to establish that market and set that new baseline for the market. And now I've managed to reduce the, the capex on, on what I'm spending per unit in half and still get the same target rent. Mm-hmm. Because we've now already, the hard part is, is over, right? We've established the market. And now it's just a matter of, you know, introducing something similar. And you're able to get the uh, baseline rents that you're after. So what kind of, uh, what kind of a rent delta are you seeing with these uh, new renovations? Yeah, about 20%. Okay. So I've managed to increase 300, 350, pretty much 300, 350 per door. Wow. Nice. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this, this, the distance, because I mean, you're so far away and you don't have a property manager. You're managing this all yourself. How are you doing it? (laughs) Yeah. uh, (laughs) Software. (laughs) So, uh, you know, you have to have systems, you have to have processes uh, and you have to be disciplined around it. You know, for example, uh, having a software where you can automate a lot of these transactions. So for, for me, for example, all my tenants need to be able to pay their rent via, you know, uh, through online banking, you know, so ACH transfers. Uh, they, don't, if they don't have that facility, then it's really not for them, right? So this is, I'm not the owner for you because I'm, I'm, I'm virtual. I, I have no interest in, you know, knocking on doors and collecting rents or sending people in. so that's first and foremost and you know the leases themselves are all done now with DocuSign I have no paper it's all DocuSign that's sent to them they review it they're standardized um, I I introduced a number of uh, fees that weren't necessarily there before like uh, pet fees uh, an admin fee that, that's paid up front when they sign the lease which is 15% of rental value. Um, so that was a way to kind of generate additional, say, value-add type income that wasn't necessarily there before. Uh, I have a freelance uh, real estate agent who represents me, and of course, he, he leases properties for me on my behalf. As these units have come up, he's been already working the phones and building a wait list, basically, people are, are really keen to get in there. Uh, he also handles things like move in and move out sort of inspection using the standard forms that we've automated that are online. And so he has access to the portal. So it's been, it's been leveraging him. And then, of course, having people on, this, on site doing the renovations has allowed me to be able to address a lot of the maintenance repair issues that have come up from time to time. Now, with the newer units, as you can imagine, there's really very little OPEX because the, the units are you know, they're brand new. Basically. So you don't expect any sort of wear and tear or replacement any of them for at least five to 10 years, I would imagine, depending on, on your tenants. So from that perspective, um, it's gone well. It's, it's, been, it's been okay. I mean, if things change in the future, of course, I can get somebody on site, but, but it hasn't been so bad. One of the tenants actually is quite good. He's a handyman. And uh, we've been able to push him as well or a little odds and ends, minor stuff. Mm-hmm. So as far as I was, I, I, you mentioned it uh, just now, as far as like move-ins and move-outs. Um, so I would take it like as far as keys and everything, those typically stay with the agent that you have working with you? Yeah, he'll slap in a, a lockbox and, you know, the keys in there. He'll hang on to the mailbox key. But what we're trying to do as well is we're trying to automate. So as part of the CapEx uh, renovation, we're doing away with uh, getting more of the keyless entry. So I'm doing away with some of the more traditional stuff. Again, I'm doing it, I'm designing it in such a way which allows me to manage that thing virtually. Yeah, I was going to ask you that because um, I actually know like the whole like keyless entry and things. Like even on my flat, you know, that I have, um, in, in, in Beijing, you know, it's all kind of like a fingerprint or passcode and everything. And then when we had an Airbnb not too long ago, it was pretty much a similar situation. We just had this app on our phone. And anytime we had new people coming in, 
we would just go ahead and, and have it automatically change the passcode and it would send it to their phone. Um, so is that kind of like the direction that you're moving in with this or? Absolutely. That's, that's definitely the direction. So I'm, part of the CapEx is replacing the windows and doors, so get impact windows and doors. And those doors will definitely have, you know, the keyless entry that, you, that you're speaking of. So we need to be able to go in, into that space if I'm going to continue to manage this thing virtually, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So, you know, another thing I was just thinking of as far as I, we can't, I, I, I don't like to say can't, but it doesn't really seem that reasonable to completely eliminate the human component. Of course, you have like the make ready, right? To make it ready, we need to have someone actually go in and do the cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, just how much more do you feel that we could, of the human element could we remove from this picture? So we don't have a necessarily an on-site property manager, right? I mean, you pretty much have this aspect automated on this online system, right? So, and then you're talking about with the keyless entry and these things. So what else do you think could be automated that we can get rid of the human element? I mean, I don't know. With, with real estate, the, the key element, of course, is I mean, most owners don't, don't even really meet the tenants, right? But it's usually when they're moving in or they're moving out. Um, and for me, I had an opportunity to meet a few of the tenants when I was actually physically there on the ground. Um, and I enjoyed that process. It's, I think now with, with COVID and what's happening in the world, you're seeing more and more social distancing. So it's probably a, it's not a bad thing. And who knows, this could be here to stay long term. It's not a bad thing to actually take out that human element to a certain degree. Still, I think going to need someone from a, from a marketing perspective who can, who can be there to talk to tenants and, and, and just profile them. You know, yeah, we do credit checks, we do background checks, that's, but I, I do think that, especially me as an HR practitioner, I think you do need to talk to people and, and get a feel for their character and integrity. To me, those are the most important attributes that I look at when I'm looking to hand over you know, a high high investment sort of asset to somebody to look after for, for months on end, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, that's something that I don't think you should ever take away, but that can be done virtually. I don't, know, I don't necessarily think you need to actually physically meet the person to do that. You can actually have a conversation. Um, and, I, and I try to do that actually for all the tenants that, even though I'm across the way around the world, I try to do that with VPN. You can easily WhatsApp, video, whatnot. You can speak to them. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure there's a lot more than that in terms of being able to eliminate and automate in that respect. So how, so how are you going to plan to scale this? So this is, I take it your first property that you're working on now, how are you planning to scale it at this point, this type of a model? I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I know everyone is like, yeah, you, you know, let's go in and you, and you just keep buying up more and more property and it just never ends and then you die. No, I, I'm not, not, for me again, what was my why? Go back to my original uh, goal and original objective. It was to be able to transition and repatriate home. And knowing I could not do what I enjoy doing as you know, a human resource professional, you know, I needed to transition to something else. I needed to work. I needed to continue to work. And, and for me, that, that, that avenue was real estate. And now real estate is already achieving the financial freedom element, which was what I was after initially, to be able to say, okay, I, just, I have something enough coming in to pay for all the expenses that are going out. And you achieve this, then okay. So... If another opportunity comes up where I'm not forcing it, I think there will be plenty of opportunity, by the way, in the next six, six months, six months to a year. I think you're going to see a lot of opportunities that, that present themselves. But I'm going to let the deal come to me. I'm not necessarily going to go out of my way to find it uh, because I've already sort of achieved financially what I was after. And if there's an opportunity to continue to scale that, 
and it doesn't take away from, let's say, my family time, you know, and it shouldn't. Um, and keep in mind, this property was also in my backyard in the sense that I'm in Miami Lakes, and this property is in Coral Springs, so relatively close, a 30-minute drive. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would look at those opportunities, and if there's opportunities to, to scale, I would look at it, but I don't want it to be, I don't want it to take away from what I originally went out and did it. You know what I mean? It's it's not something that I want it to be all-consuming. I sleep good at night knowing I have very little debt. Um, you know, now I think a lot of people are struggling with potentially what could happen if people are unable to pay, for example, in light of uh, losing jobs. I don't have that issue, you know, and, and I, I don't necessarily need to rush into something where maybe that becomes an issue, where I become over leveraged by taking on additional and trying to scale this thing. So, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Mm-hmm. So what advice would you have to new people that are looking at, you know, basically getting into the industry? I'm, I'm new myself. <laughs> um, so the, the key, the key thing is, you know, figure out what your why is, you know, what, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Um, you know, you need to be passionate about it. Like I really enjoy this thing. I, I enjoy all aspects of the process, dealing with tenants, uh, you know, the marketing, the renovation, uh, you know, making, seeing this thing grow and, and become something that, uh, that I believe it can become, proving the naysayers wrong, all of that. You, you really have to enjoy that aspect. And, and if you do, you, it'll be a much easier transition. You've got to like numbers, so definitely my, my advice to newbies would be to get familiar with the numbers. Uh, Excel is your best friend, I think, just... Get, get the numbers into a, like some sort of deal analyzer. And uh, don't just look at one or two aspects of those, uh, those numbers. I mean, look at cash on cash, look at cap rates, look at the OPEX, uh, the expense ratios, uh, see how you can come up with a plan. I actually have a business plan. You know, so before I bought the property, I had a business plan in place and had a five-year outlook. I think that's important. So people should treat it like it's a business. Kaisaki used to always say, mind your business, right? Mind your own business. And I, I, that's all I ever do I, is I constantly, you know, in front of my spreadsheet and looking at the, what's coming in, what's going out, and what do I need to do? How do I enhance? And so as a new investor, that's what I would advise. And you're going to learn a lot by doing. So you can read a lot. And I definitely encourage people to read attend conferences but there's only so much you can learn uh, in that space once you're actually doing it yourself and making mistakes yourself you will make mistakes no doubt and in real estate they tend to be expensive uh, but you know you'll learn you'll learn a great deal and, and if you get good at it you'll be very profitable so yeah what, uh, and speaking of reading, what book would you recommend for people? Yeah, I'm not an avid reader. Uh, the books that I've read is mostly Kaisaki and, and a lot of the, a lot of, I think, the authors that are associated with him. Uh, you know, I think it was uh, McElroy was one, I think it was the ABCs of, of real estate investing. I thought that was a good book. Uh, for me, it was really just trying to understand the fundamentals, right? Uh, and I knew going in, the, I didn't, wasn't interested in flipping or anything like that. I was more interested in buying an asset and uh, renovating it, you know, and hanging on to it long term, and having it generate uh, cash flow for it, and eventually pay off the, the mortgage. Uh, so it was books around that, just mm-hmm. kind of the pitfalls associated with that. There, I'm sure there are plenty of other books out there, but I'm not an avid reader. I just don't have the time with, with my job in the mm-hmm. corporate world. Um, okay. So if our listeners wanted to reach out to you, how could they do that? Uh, my, my hotmail address is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, so it's Sam underscore Khatib, and that's K-H-A-T-I-B at hotmail. Uh, you can also get a hold of me via Facebook. Much like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Samir. It was really a pleasure having you on here, and I appreciate you sharing with us. Thanks, Mike.
Thank you for having me.